we will now continue our survey into 1 John, subtitled, A Survey of the First of Three Epistles, written to the Church of the Time, to warn against straying away from the faith, while yet encouraging them to brave the Christian fight in love and obedience. Last week, I had the opportunity of giving a refresher and concluding with John 1, verse... I'm sorry, verse, 1 John 1, verse 1. And today we'll actually take the time to actually finish the entire chapter. Here now, 1 John 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested. And we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and we heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you may too have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you. That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Let us go to the Lord our God in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for this Sabbath day that you've given us. And wherever we may be, wherever we are doing right now, Lord, we take the time to sit back and take hold of the word that's being preached, Lord. May this word be edifying to the people as they take in your word, and Lord, provide them the willing love and the childlike mindset to receive what's being preached here, to let us show to them that you are continually with them to this age. It's in Christ's most holy, precious name we pray. Amen. So, in our first verse, what was from the beginning, it gives an indication to the audience and a reference back to the prior knowledge that they were given. So she think of it from the terms of when they came to the faith. And then likely, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked, and what we have touched concerning the word of life draws the personal testimony that is of John the Apostle. The very title, the Office of Apostle bears exclusivity that honors for such a hold. For recall, many countless times, many people have seen the Messiah. They have touched the Messiah. Many have ate with the Messiah. Many have held him in his home, in their homes. But this title, the act of apostleship, shows an act of honor and can be only levied by God alone. And by John making this emphasis, and he will continue to show this emphasis continually in the chapter with such verbs and adage and adverbs again and again. It makes apparent what he is trying to convey to the people. To continue, we start, we continue to verse number two. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and it was manifested to us. The life that was manifested is indeed a continuation from the first verse, the word of life, the fountain of life, and be it that fountain of life is God in and of himself. It is original and it is also eternal and he is the author and the giver of life as we've seen from the beginning. In chapter 1 in Genesis, as he breathed life into man. But notice the understanding 
and the object of our faith, Jesus Christ, being that life is what is being spoken of here. John 1, 14, in the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For then such is the eternal life that is within the Messiah, be it that his record and his proper deity to come and dwell amongst men, God amongst men, is a show and is an understanding and is a, tes a testament to the world that God is continually with his people. But what we want you to understand in the message that's being proclaimed, and particularly in this particular verse, it is to be in clear point that all men are meant to die. And we know that by the ramifications of sin. But be it as it may, that God in his true decree provided the way out so that it is no shock and surprise when the Messiah says in 851, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Why is it so? It then makes sense why David speaks with such exuberance in Psalms 21, 4 through 6. He acts life of you, and you gave it to him. The length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. So you can see what John was trying to early on proclaim to the audience very truly that they understand that partaking in the relationship that is with the Messiah, there is life and life continually. So then we continue, which was with the Father and was manifested as shows to continue unionship that is within the Godhead. Galatians 4 verse 4, when the fullness of time came, God set forth his son, born of a woman, under the law. We move on to verse number three. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. This is a repeat, just to confirm. But what you can see here, based on the ministry of the word that the Apostle Paul is trying to convey, is a show in the office of what it means to repeat again and again, like a father who tries to discipline his son or daughter and children alike, and how by repetition they give the onus and the acclaim to them to know how important their word actually is. Again, we see the Apostle John take that same adage. So then, what is that too? You may have fellowship with us. And what is he trying to purvey here? It is in joining and partaking in the advantages that comes with the gospel church. And that understanding that you will not only be in union here, but also in union with the Father and the Son after this life. And what indeed is this fellowship that is with the Father and the Son? We can see based on the covenant of the redemption and also to some who knows that the covenant of grace, we see the Father being the one that elects, the Son being the one that redeems and the Holy Spirit being the one that seals. And in the Messiah's work, being on this earth, we saw how he portrayed that relationship to the Father. And being as is so, we then understand why the rhetoric that was coming from the apostles mirrored the image that the Messiah was conveying. Mark 14, 36, 
the Messiah states, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Again, Romans 8, 15, For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians 4, verse 6, Because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his sons into your hearts, crying again, Abba, Father. Such intimacy and such familiarity that the Messiah was able to show and convey in his life. You too, being sons and daughters adopted into this working, which is Christianity, you too have that spirit and the Apostle John was trying to convey this to the audience. So then by which, in the concluding piece of this particular adage, we write these things so that your joy may be made complete. Why? To increase in the graces as you continue to work your faith on this world. You will be tested. But nonetheless, through your tests, the Messiah continually show that he's with you. We learn in the catechism lesson today about the attributes that are shared between us and God and, cute, and be acute and to understand what is transpiring. We must understand the plan from, e from even the beginning of time, Ephesians 1, 3, and four, understanding that there was a plan made to rectify where we had a standing with God in, to, in order to bring things into his own purpose. Now, our joys in this world, and I'm gonna continue off that notion, our joys in this world seems to be very materialistic. And the reason why I say materialistic is because we do what well we see in our own eyes to bring us pleasure. But the joy spoken of here is not something that is materialistic, but it's something of something more spiritual. For even King Solomon explained in his preaching that you may try to achieve something great and you may try to desire whatever is in your eyes, but notice everything that you strive for on this earth is vanity and striving after the wind, for there is no profit under the sun, Ecclesiastes 2, 9 through 11. But we hear in Matthew the words from the Messiah himself, where he speaks about your treasures and the understanding of where they are stored. Truly, if you are one who share and are obedient to the word, then it's understandable. The Messiah will make very clear what your treasure is and what your joy is found. For in Matthew 6, 21, true is the saying, for where your treasure is, there is also your heart. Psalm 16, five and six, the Lord is my portion of my inheritance in my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. And indeed, my, and my heritage is beautiful to me. See here how David taken part in the understanding of his communion with God. And over all else, over all treasures, all material, materialistic things found in this world, they have no pleasure to his eyes, but to only be found that his standing with God is upright. We now come to verse 5. This message, what we have heard from him, and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This message is more, in some interpretation, is seen as this is a promise. So then the meaning of the apostle is coming to the forefront. Where so what this meaning is, he continues, and we announce to you that God is light. 
and what do you understand about this particular illumination? This light is a show to men who were darkened in sin, men who only know to do but evil. God is the light and the way to show what to do that is good. He walks in the light, and so he's of a pure spirit. There is no mixture of darkness within God. And furthermore, if he is the light to illuminate men, it is therefore by his grace we are then instructed. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. For God knows all. He knows all the workings of this world. Job 42, verse 2. I know that you do all things and your, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. So it is in with this, we ask the Messiah through the workings of the Messiah. We ask God that he keep us upright, that we continue, continue to show that loving care that is of that relationship between us and him. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, the rock, his work is perfect for all your, his ways are just a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And therefore, we go on to verse number six. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If this were to be so, understanding already that God is light and everything that comes from him is good. Those who obey to him and those who are in fellowship with him, God will continue to sanctify you. But in your misperception and through your walk, you relish in your sin rather than to repent. This warning is made for you. For you were to tell the people you have fellowship with him. Well, if you have fellowship with him, once you've sinned, you repented. We continue again in the adage of Job 42, verse 6. Therefore, I retract, O God. I repent in dust and ashes. But then there's those who state that they do walk with him, but don't repent. Then it's no joke. When the Messiah says in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he gives you the adage on to who will. For if you say you will have fellowship with him, then, he, then it makes sense why he says, but he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. So then I bring to you this adage of those who make the proclamation that we I walk with the Lord. I walk in his attributes, but yet your practice shows the worldly worlds of sin. I bring to you Simon Magnus. Aha, I'll bring back the introduction full circle here in Acts 8, 13. We were told Simon believed. He was baptized, and he continued on with Philip and observed the signs and great miracles taking place, and he was constantly amazed. Aha, a man who dealt with sorcery saw the workings of the Spirit in the life and the effects that it was having onto the people and come to realize he had his own way, as long as I can get in the group. Maybe I may have this ability. Well, as we continue in chapter 8, we see as the apostles continue to spread the workings and expand the kingdom, Simon decided to offer the money. And he said, 
to them. Give me this authority as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But notice the admonishment made by Peter. May your silver perish with you, because you thought you can obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. And notice what he tells him. Repent of this wickedness of your heart and pray the Lord. Notice, pray the Lord. If possible, the intentions of your heart may be forgiven you. And I showed you. And it's funny how those who seem to be dispensationalists seem to discount the Old Testament, but that's a different story for a different day. Even in the Old Testament, Job showed he had a heart for God and therefore repented in chapter 42. But Simon here, Simon doesn't even take that into account. He probably wasn't even listening. He still probably had magic wax in his ears. For he said back to him, pray to the Lord for me yourself so that nothing of what you say may come upon me. How can you then not take into consideration what is being spoken of here? If you have fellowship with him. And we continue on to the next verse. So much so that if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we will have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanses us all. I'm going to show you how the two ties. Because we already explained the understanding of the, of the fact that he is a light and being such pure, he knows nothing but good. And being that he is in the light, he is nothing but righteousness, the imputed righteousness that comes from Messiah. Once a man fully makes the clarification that I have repented of my sins and look to you for repentance. The fellowship that we have one with another is the one that Simon Magnus was missing. For if he had that fellowship, he would have done what was commanded by Peter. Pray to God for repentance. But no, he did not. He asked Peter to pray on his behalf. So the adage here that we have fellowship one with another is the fellowship that we have with God himself. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through, uh, verse 9. God is faithful and through who, sorry, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And by this, and by this fellowship that you have with the Messiah, you go to God the Father through him Acts for repentance. For the verse continues, the blood of Jesus, his son, is the one that cleanses us from all sins. Psalms 32, 1 through 2. How blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sins is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now then, I come and tell you that this new life that is flowing with the union that is with God, you can see, bringing it back full circle again, why John had to make this notion address what we have seen and what we have heard and we proclaim and we announce to you because there were men among you who are trying to tie you away from the faith with the evil doctrines of the world, particularly in our case, Gnosticism. But we understand full and forefront by the workings that God has in store for his people and the envisionment that he had, the apostle makes very clear what the truth actually is. So again, I want Calvin to speak on this union with bond here because it's very 
important that we have an understanding of why the message that John is speaking to the audience then is still apparent to us now. Calvin states here, after having taught what a bond, what the bond is of our union with God, John shows what fruit flows from it. That our sins are freely remitted for, for Christ is no redeemer except for those who turn away from iniquity and lead into a new life. In short, remissions of sins cannot be separated from repentance, nor can the peace of God be in the hearts of those who lack the fear of God. Therefore, it is a benefit perpetually residing in the church and is daily offered to the faithful. For who can otherwise please God since all are guilty before him? For however strong a desire may be, for us to act rightly, we still hauntingly owe to God. So then, by the new sins that continually separate us from the graces, the saints have the need to seek daily forgiveness of their sins, for this alone keeps them in the family of God. Could not have been said better, especially for today. We come then to verse number nine, which states, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Such ignorance to have and such a discredit to the gospel itself. Why would I say this? The Messiah states, it is not those who are healthy who needs a physician, but to those who are sick, I did not come Oh, sorry, to those who are sick, they're the ones in need. So therefore, I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. So if you have no issues, then you are in no need of God then. In fact, be it as it may, if you have no issues, how does death still continue to reign? Such a question philosophically that they still cannot continue to answer. So, I say this to you then, if you are going to continue in the relationship with the, fam of the Messiah and have fellowship one to another with him, you must understand clear in point that sin is what we need to be saved from. Sin is something that deeming our disobedience to God in the relationship that Adam had with him had to be rectified. It's, it is with this adage that we understand why the Messiah in speaking to the Jews in chapter eight tells them about slavery and the workings that came with that dynamic of sin. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. But sin does not remain in the house forever. Notice the point that he's making to the audience here. And don't overthink this. There is an understanding. There is a provision by which it was spoken in Job 42. There is your purpose and your will. Nothing can thwart it. So it's within his provision, within his providence, things came to being. And being as much that sin came into being by the secondary causes as we know them in our Reformed faith. We can see now the Messiah showing the plan, but that was not the intention for it to stay. For the Son does remain forever. He's bringing it back to where the focus lies. He's bringing it back to where our understanding needs to come into a full and in no abrupt way. He wants us to put pinpoint back and glorify him because the sun makes you free. And if the sun frees you, you will be free indeed. So why so? 
it's with this that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Again, it is a show with this. Calvin makes interesting point across about how important it is for us to confess our sins and to look back to the Messiah, for he is a faithful judge. He understands how miserable this world can be. And I found this one to be quite humorous, but Calvin makes a good point here. Few indeed consider how miserable and wretched a doubting conscience is. But the truth is, hell reigns where there is no peace with God. So how can we say that we live in this world with no peace and have no peace of mind as we continue to labor and labor and build fruit. Ecclesiastes already taught us that we profit nothing as we continue to labor and labor because once we're gone from this world, it just goes on and feeds another hand. So it's all vanity. But the Son, the Messiah, the eternal life, the word of life shows you that there is life after this. In particular, being free from sin. So therefore, once you have asked for that forgiveness, and once you, your conscience is of peace of mind, you will continually to walk into the path of righteousness. And of no doubt, it is not just one particular time appointed, but as we continue to move on forward, as we continue to walk in this world, he will cleanse us from all our righteousness. Your mindset will be not to disobey him. And especially when you consider this particular time, where we are in terms of sitting on your couch or on your desk, listening to this telecast, watching this telecast. You guys are grouped as a family. So the brethren are amongst one another. And it's by that encouragement that if you need counseling, they can lend a helping hand. And by the men in the office standing here and dictating and basically extolling the word onto you, it's a show that the Messiah and God in his providence continues to show his overstretching hand to care for your soul. For what? is the expectation of the church as a whole. What is to be presented of them? To mirror their husband. To mirror the workings, that is, of their head. Ephesians 5, 27. So that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot, no wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. And of our last verse here, verse 10, we, have, we say, we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and the word is not with us. Well, what we do we know? First and foremost, we already know the understanding that comes with clearly in point, seeing we're in need of a savior. Recall again, previously, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. So from the point at time of birth, Psalms 51 verse 5, my mother bore me in iniquity and in sin did she conceive me. We came out spewing lies. So for those to say that I am without sin, again, the apostles making a point, it's not... It's not possible that you can stand and be amongst us for if you say you have no sin, what is the basis of your faith? Because it's going to mirror again 
if you recall, Romans chapter 3. Do you remember what Paul was explaining to the Jews in Rome? What then? I start at verse number 3. If some did not believe, their unbelief will nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be. Rather, let God be found true, and every man be found a liar. For it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail, prevail when you are judged. For you to say that you have no sin is blasphemy against God and the gospel of itself. What's the intention that the Messiah would say such verbiage that I, would, I have come to call sinners? What was the point if you're not a sinner? Go and do the healings that you claim since you have no sin and you are good. Go and clean and heal the world. Provide all the humanitarian effects that you were looking to do because your soul craves to do something quote unquote good. But no matter what humanitarian effect that you may conceive, cause, no matter how much money you think you can give away, no matter what rhetoric you spew, at the intellectual and the university level so that everybody gives you that glorification. If it's outside the realm of Christ, you're in trouble. And it's very, very poignant, and it's very, very clear that you have an issue to a foot. Because you can't beat death, but there was one. Because you can get sick, there was one who could not get sick. And there was one who exemplified full and foremost to live a life so perfect, to live a life so necessary so that we can see an example to be made. It is with this the apostle is giving the clear evidence in the promise so that you know it took someone so good that God had to kill and sacrifice him on your behalf. And I don't mean that from the humanist perspective that it spreads all around, but for the behalf of the people who will come and obey him. He took that man and sacrificed him in order to make a just appreciation for the sins of the world and in that John is making very clear the men who were amongst you here are the checkpoints and if they don't clear this or they start spewing this rhetoric I don't care how smart they are I don't care how much money they have I don't care what standing they have they are not Christians and you are not to believe them and they will go on to further note that if you have relations with them, you should check your own self. That's what John's trying to convey. And with the closing of this chapter and its appeal to today's world, I have no doubt with the way that we have been fixated to our houses, we start to check our own self. We start to think about our own faith. Our own sins are brought to the forefront. And when you do pray, do come to remembrance that the Messiah is continually with those who obey him. And it's evident. It's shown right here. It's explained and is given clear and upfront focus when we catechize and when we extol. He is continually extending his outreach hand over his people. But his expectation on you is to be obedient. And in your obedience, you would therefore follow him and you will be served and being led by his example. Let us go to the Lord God in prayer.